justice as liberty, is freedom the point. So last class, um, we began to examine this sort of general question, whether justice and civil rights or civil liberties are in tension with each other. And of course, as recently as a generation ago, that would have been viewed as a laughable, almost incoherent question. Of course, civil rights, vindication of civil rights is about vindication of justice. That's sort of, for lack of a better term, the liberal view, although in the readings for today, you see that's, that itself is a contested um, word. But to, let's, for lack of a better term, we'll call it the liberal view is that the point of civil rights is to secure the requirements of justice for persons. All right, and it starts to disintegrate um, around the edges and starting to disintegrate maybe even in the middle um, in recent years. We see extreme dissatisfaction with the particular American expression of civil liberties um, in Adrian Vermeule's essay, which we considered last time. Um, and then we see ways in which the Supreme Court of the United States has failed to vindicate founding civil liberties in Professor Soman's essay. Um, so last class, we were speaking about specifically about the American expression of this civil, liberty or civil libertarian ideal. Today, we're going to look more fundamentally at um, civil liberties and justice generally, and specifically this idea of liberty. What does it mean? What's its relation to property? And what is its relationship with justice? So, um, really dark in there, but I guess all the lights are on. Um, <clears throat> we'll begin with Locke. And um, this, of course, is chapter five of his second treatise. Uh, you know this quite well, of course. You've read it for Foundations of Law. I'm sure many of you read it in high school and undergraduate. You've encountered it in a number of different places. I want to focus, I want to, I want to emphasize some aspects of the, of the fifth chapter of the second treatise that maybe you haven't thought about before, or maybe you haven't thought about as deeply before as its implications for um, civil government and consent of the governed and um, the theories of government, political philosophy. Um, which is what chapter five in the second treatise generally is, is most well known for. I want to focus instead on the, juris, the jurisprudence in Locke's chapter five. And right off the bat, very first sentence, Locke is going to direct us to both natural reason and revelation. And so Right off the bat, Locke's jurisprudence looks an awful lot like the jurisprudence of Aristotle and Aquinas, specifically Aquinas, <clears throat> which is interesting to note in light of Deneen's later criticism of Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau and Bacon and the other Enlightenment thinkers. The accusation that's going to be leveled against Locke before we get done is that Locke insofar as he's ushering in this new ideology of liberalism, whatever that is, is rejecting what's good and valuable and important about the tradition that came before. Um, Locke doesn't seem to understand himself to be doing that. He seems to be understand himself, if we take him seriously, um, as carrying on the tradition that has come before. And he starts right off the bat with natural law and revelation as his two primary sources of authority. He's quoting scriptures. He's appealing to um, the natural law. Um, and then one more observation in this first paragraph, and that is, what is Locke's aim in the second treatise? And it shouldn't escape our notice that Locke's aim at least as he frames it initially, is actually quite modest. His aim at first uh, is simply to refute the idea of the divine right of kings, right? He has a particular target in mind with this text, and that is Filmer's argument in favor of the divine right of kings, which of course at this, you know, in, in English history has been asserted by 
you know, the Norman kings, and then later by um, Elizabeth and James and Charles the first, um, and has generated um, very recently in Locke's time quite a little, quite a lot of controversy and bloodshed. Um, and so he has a very practical problem on his hands that he's trying to deal with, and that is, how are we going to respond to this claim that the crown is justified in doing what the crown wants to do? That the, the, the power of the crown is essentially, in this matter of principle, unlimited. That's the project from Locke's perspective. It's to respond to the claim that the king rules by divine right and to respond to that claim drawing on the traditions of the natural law and, and the Christian scriptures. So in section 26, he begins the very first word of section 26. Again, shouldn't escape our notice. God, who had given the world to men in common, had also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. Um, and Blackstone, who's going to come later, is going to be somewhat critical of Locke. He's going to talk about those writers who had these airy metaphysical notions about states of nature, thought experiments. But Locke and Blackstone both are going to appeal to this idea found in the Hebrew scriptures, way back in the first couple chapters of Genesis, that the dominion over the earth of human beings is a delegated authority from God. Okay, so, so far, so good. So far, in the sections 25 and 26, it looks like Locke is very much in the mainstream of the tradition. Section 27, we get a statement that might or might not be in the mainstream of the tradition, depending on what he means. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. Okay. What does that mean? A couple of terms to focus on. What does it mean that every man has a property in his own person? Does it mean uh, that every human being sort of owns himself in a radical sense, that no one else has any authority over him? Is that what he's claiming? Um, is he talking about each human being's um, resources or capacities? No one has a just or rightful claim against what I can produce, what I can give, what I can bring about, what I can create? Um, is he talking about property in the sense of alienation? Right? No one has a right to sell my labor but myself. Uh, depending on what he means by property, this claim might be really, really radical and new and radically individualistic in the way that Deneen is going to accuse him of being. Or it could be a relatively modest claim that, say, slavery is unjust. Um, or that um, uh, God has given us our rational faculties um, so that we can flourish. So we, we want to know how to interpret this. Yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. What comes after the colon does seem quite, um, quite emphatic and maybe even radical. Nobody has any right to but himself. Not even my children, not my wife, not my parents. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Um, question 28, section 28. Okay, he's got this problem now. He's set up the general proposition that there's no divine right of kings because God gave the earth to all human beings in common. But now the problem that raises is then how do you get private property? So how do you, in other words, preserve the institution of property and all the institutions of society that are built on the institution of property 
if you've thrown out the divine right of kings. If you throw out dominion, the dominion of man over man, do you also lose the dominion over man over the earth? And um, of course, as you know, the principle to which he appeals is the principle of labor. But the labor involved in appropriating the goods of the earth to oneself is the basis for one's moral claim to the resources one has appropriated. Uh, labor isn't alone sufficient. It has to be labor that is put to the use of providing for one's needs and wants. Because that, of course, is the purpose for which God gave the earth to Adam and Eve and their children, so they can make use of it for their flourishing. So it's not just any kind of labor. Um, it's not just a matter of mixing labor, as some later liberal theorists uh, would would claim. It's it's labor that is um, that puts a distinction, as he says, between the appropriated goods and the common where the appropriated goods are appropriated for the purpose of one's flourishing. And that principle is a matter of natural law or natural right. It does not depend upon the positive enactments of the society. So he says in section 30, amongst those who are counted the civilized part of mankind who have made and multiplied positive laws to determine property, the original law of nature for the beginning of property in what was before common still takes place. So in some way, this natural right is going to persist even after we enter into a civilized society where the particular incidents of property are going to be determined by positive law. And we're not going to get there because we're not going to go beyond book five, but this gets very complicated when we're exchanging natural rights for civil rights. Um, and there's all sorts of questions to be asked about, uh, interesting questions about uh, the extent to which the civil rights uh, share the same contours as natural rights. For example, do our civil rights still come with the enough and as good proviso which we'll get to in a moment, um, and so forth. Bracket those and set them aside. I wanna focus on the, the more fundamental jurisprudence here. Okay, section 31. Um, okay, so we have a natural right of property. Uh, does that mean that property in the state of nature or property just, that's product of just of natural law is unlimited, that we can use this property however we want? He says, no, the same law of nature that does, that does by this means give us property does also bound that property too. So for example, as much as anyone can make use of to any advantage of life before it spoils, that's your property. But a corollary of that is whatever is beyond this is more than your share and belongs to others. So that's the enough proviso. And then um, in section 33, it's the enough and as good left proviso. Um, and the justification for this is in section 32. God and his reason, the, the very last um, two sentences, God and his reason commanded humans to subdue the earth, i.e. improve it for the benefit of life, and therein lay out something upon it that was his own, his labor. He that in obedience to this command of God subdued, tilled, and sowed any part of it, thereby annexed it to something, annexed to it something that was his property, which another had no title to, nor could without injury take from. So fulfilling the command of God to subdue the earth, to till it, to make good things out of it, one acquires a right to it, which is superior to everyone else's right. But that right is subject to the inherent limitation that you're only supposed to subdue that part of the earth that you yourself can make beneficial use of. And you're supposed to leave enough and is good for everyone else. And that's all part of the law of nature block things, even before we get into the specifications of positive law. Okay, so that looks like something like a natural law argument or a natural right argument or what today would, would be called a deontological argument. This is an argument that doesn't depend on um, uh, any empirical claims. It doesn't depend on predicting 
um, uh, uh, how, how, how things are going to turn out for us. It's a matter of right. It's a, a matter of um, competent jurisdiction. No one else has competent jurisdiction over my labor and my person. And so when I add my labor to, 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 um, to common resources to bring about new goods, um, uh, there's no, there could be no justification for someone else taking that from me. Then, beginning in section 37, Locke begins to move into arguments that are more ambiguous in their character. So here he begins to talk about, he offers sort of a, a second justification for natural property rights. And that is that when you um, disaggregate labor from the original common resource, it's labor that is doing most of the work in producing the goods of the earth from which people benefit. Um, and he goes on at some length about this. In section 37, he says, um, about a third of the way down the paragraph, to which let me add that he who appropriates land to himself by his labor does not lessen but increase the common stock of mankind for the provisions serving to the support of human life produced by one acre of enclosed and cultivated land are 10 times more than those which are yielded by an acre of land of an equal richness lying waste in common. And actually he says that's actually probably a conservative estimate. It's probably closer to 100 to 1. And he wants us to focus on, um, uh, he, he, he draws biblical authority for this. He talks about the case of Cain and Abel um, and how uh, property is naturally going to grow up between Cain and Abel and their tribes as their families increase. Um, didn't turn out that way, of course, in the case of Cain and Abel, because an act of natural injustice intervened. Um, but he says as families increase, this is section 37, 38, and industry enlarged their stocks, their possessions enlarged with the need of them. So they incorporated, settled themselves together, built cities, and then by consent, they came in time to set the bounds of their distinct territories and settle whose property is what. That's sort of how it progresses historically, he thinks. Um, and then he goes on for the next several sections, giving us all sorts of evidence for this. Um, uh, famously or infamously appealing to the difference between um, the value of land and natural resources in Europe versus the value of land and natural resources in the New World, where um, private property has not yet been instituted. Um, and uh, an argument that, of course, is later going to be used as justification for um, the settling of property rights uh, of land that had once been inhabited by Native Americans. Okay, so that's sort of a, a brief survey of Locke's fifth chapter focused on jurisprudential elements. And from this, I want to ask three questions, which I just want to sort of put on the table for later discussion. From this, do we get the sense that Locke is, in fact, the father of some ideology called liberalism? Is that what Locke is doing here? Is he founding an ideology, whether on purpose or accidental? Is he founding a new ideology that we could call liberalism? Or maybe to put it differently, to what extent is Locke's um, affirmative case consistent with the natural law and Christian traditions that have come before, and what to what extent is it a break from those traditions? This is going to be a really important question when we get to the Deneen, um, the debate between Pat Deneen and Sam Gray. Second set of questions. Is Locke's argument essentially a rights-based argument, or is it essentially a consequentialist utilitarian argument? To what is he appealing? And there seems to be evidence for both, right? Is his argument that, um, is it a consequentialist argument? Is it essentially that we're all gonna be better off to the extent that we protect and secure investments of productive labor in natural resources by securing prop private property of the uh, productive laborer? Um, or, is he saying uh, it is just wrong to take from the productive laborer that which he is appropriated out of the commons? Um, whether or not 
we would benefit from doing so. And this is going to be an important question when we get to Professor Epstein's essay. What kind of an argument is this quote unquote classical liberal argument about natural liberties and particularly property rights? Is it grounded in a, a, a classic understanding of right and wrong or is it grounded in um, some sort of utilitarian calculus? And then the third set of questions is, um, does this argument still work today? Notice that Locke's argument is primarily about appropriation of tangible resources, and in particular, scarce tangible resources like land. Tangible resources that are inherently rivalrous Right? My family, if my family is occupying this piece of land, then your family's not. If I'm plucking these apples, then you're not going to get to eat them unless I share them. Um, does this argument still hang together? Does it still have the same normative force today when most valuable resources are intangible and the products of uh, intellectual achievement? Things like intellectual property, patented inventions, copyrighted um, uh, expressions, trademarks associated with business goodwill, um, uh, platforms created by you know, Facebook, Apple, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. The sort of intangible resources that are not by their nature inherently rivalrous. We could talk about actually whether that's the case, but in the conventional understanding, they're not inherently rivalrous. Um, and arguably, not scarce, um, and does that um, detract from the force of Locke's argument um, today? Okay, um, moving on to Professor Epstein's essay. Um, Epstein is clearly very Lockean. Whether he's interpreting Locke correctly, I'll leave to Locke experts. But he's clearly very lucky in, and um, he thinks that Locke's thought can be distilled into something known as a class that he calls a classical liberal theory. Right, so, so Locke is making an argument that Locke understands to be grounded in natural law and divine law against the divine right of kings which also still preserves for him rights of private property. Epstein says what he's come up with is a theory. And this theory is in fact the basis of our constitution. So it says in my new book, Classical Liberal Constitution, this is six years ago, I argue that a sound interpretation of the Constitution requires reading its key provisions in light of the comprehensive classical liberal theory that animated their introduction, that is their introduction into American constitutionalism. Um, and this is essentially an intellectual tradition of private property and limited government. So, that, so he's identifying this tradition, which most people identify with Locke, as its own tradition, separate and apart from the natural law and divine law traditions more generally. So classical liberal theory or tradition, which is primarily focused on private property and limited government. So it's its own thing. Okay, skipping ahead to the um, part caption constitutional ad hocery. Private property is the central institution of classical liberal theory. So you've got a theory. This theory animates our constitution. And this theory rests on a particular institution. And the institution is private property. Um, quite different from the institution of the monarchy. Quite different from the institution of democracy. Right? So it's not it's not the claims of, uh, you know, the Norman kings and James I. And it's not what they had in Athens. It's a different kind of institution. He's going to go on to tell us later it's a Republican kind of institution. 
but the particular institution on which our constitution is founded is private property. Now, interestingly, the first mention of private property in the constitution um, is actually in uh, Article 1, Section 8, and it's the intellectual property clause, which confers on Congress the power to secure to inventors patents in their inventions and to artists and authors copyrights in their expressions. Epstein doesn't mention that. Instead, he skips to something which was ratified after the Constitution, and that is the Fifth Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which provides, and, he, and curiously, not the Due Process Clause, which of course is straightforwardly Lockean, I mean, it is Locke's trio of life, liberty, and property, but the Takings Clause, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And he says the takings clause strikes a balance between a radical libertarianism, which would create holdout problems and give owners an absolute immunity from government action with respect to property on one hand. Um, and on the other hand, uh, what he calls the totalitarian vision that routinely allows the government to take private property for public use without paying any compensation at all. Why? is he focused on the takings clause and compensation? I think the next couple sentences give us a clue. The just compensation requirement splits the difference, letting the government force the transfer of property, but only upon payment of just compensation. And the state thus avoids the holdout problem without creating the alternative risk of exploitation. We're talking about holdout problems, risks, costs, compensation. This is not a rights-based interpretation of the American founding. This is an economic interpretation of the American founding. So the rights are not standing on their own authority. They're not standing on the authority of natural law or divine law. In fact, he expressly rejects the idea that there could be any limitations on the competent jurisdiction of the state over private property. It's a question of forcing the state to internalize the negative externalities that it imposes on owners disproportionately when it expropriates their property without just compensation. It's an economic interpretation of the classical liberal founding. Okay, now he's gonna go on to give us a more detailed argument why um, the classical liberal founding on an econ in a, in economic terms is a better founding than the revisionist uh, founding that Justice Brennan gives us in his interpretation of the takings clause in the Penn Central. So um, the elegant compromise which we had at the founding is spoiled in 1978. Justice Brennan, whose inexcusable ad hocery trampled over private property rights, um, he, he, with the back of his hand, swats away this private property, this foundational private property institution, which fa facilitates enormous gains from trade. Again, it's an economic critique. In Penn Central in 1978, Brennan's landmark decision severely undermines the constitutional protection for private property, and that's a problem for all these economic reasons. Now the CY says you should go back to the 1960 decision of Armstrong versus United States. Armstrong is a classic case which takes private property in its common law dimensions. So remember the problem in Penn Central is what? It's the, the fundamental question is when air development rights are severed from the possession of the train station and then the air development rights are obsolesced or taken away or however you want to conceive of it by this new regulation, this ordinance, which places um, uh, a landmark preservation designation on the train station. Is that a deprivation of property? In other words, uh, the, are the air rights, the air development rights, property within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment? That's sort of jurisprudentially how you can conceive of the analysis in Penn Central. And as Epstein correctly points out, for centuries before Penn Central, um, the answer would have obviously been yes. Yes, that's property. There's no problem conceiving of different property interests in estates 
in a single resource. And, and you see it very clearly in Armstrong versus United States, where the question he says is whether a subcontractor did work on a naval vessel in Maine waters was entitled to place a material amends lien on the property when his general contractor failed, pay, failed to pay for the services, and then the government takes the vessel away, thus dissolving the lien. Remember, at common law, uh, a mechanics lien or material amends lien requires possession of the thing to perfect. This is before the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, so uh, uh, Justice Black, Richard Epstein, and pretty much every jurist who came before Justice Brennan would have had no problem saying, yeah, that's a taking. Because the lien is property in the vessel. Is it possession of the whole vessel? No. Is it a right to use the vessel any way he wants? No. But it's a property interest. And we have no, con no problem conceiving of the right of use and, and uh, alienation as a distinct right from the right of, perfect, of uh, possession for the purpose of per perfecting um, the lien for compensation for labor provided. Um, so this is Epstein on Hugo Black's assessment of the nature of the inquiry. The Fifth Amendment's guarantee that private property shall not be taken for a public use without just compensation was designed to bar governments from forcing some people alone to bear public burdens, which in all fairness and justice should be borne by the public as a whole. Okay, so you could defend Armstrong versus the United States on common law or natural law or natural rights grounds and say, look, once the parties have divided the rights up on their own actions, the government delivered this ship up for this, um, fellow to work on, and therefore by, by its own volitional act, created this lien, and it would be beyond the lawful competence of the government to destroy that property right. That's one way you could go. You could go sort of common law, natural law, natural rights account, where it's just, it's just wrong, and therefore it's a taking of non-lawful taking. That's not the route that Epstein and Black go. Black suggests in Armstrong, that essentially the reason why it's wrong is because it shifts burdens from the public as a whole to this one owner. In other words, it's an economic reading of the takings clause that Justice Black has given us. Brennan then ratifies that economic reading of the takings clause. And if the moment you accept that premise that the takings clause is consequentialist, utilitarian, economic, however you want to characterize it, then there's no principled reason to, re to resist Brennan's characterization of the main concern of the takings clause as being about vindicating the owner's investment-backed expectations. Now, the, ma the material man in the um, Armstrong case obviously has investment-backed expectations at stake, but Brennan reasons that Penn Central Railroad does not. They never expected to get this particular valuable use out of this land when they first built the railroad station. And so as a matter of economic analysis, there's nothing inherently unfair about forbidding them to use their development rights. And so the obvious question, it seems to me, for someone like Richard Epstein is, to the extent that Epstein accepts Black's and Brennan's economic interpretation of the takings clause in the American founding, does Epstein himself have any principled reason to object to Brennan's interpretation of the takings clause in Penn Central? Or is he just criticizing Brennan's economic analysis, that Brennan didn't, didn't have a sufficiently robust economic understanding of the implications of making um, property rights subject to this ad hoc judicial inquiry? Um, and it seems like it's the latter. He says, at, under the heading Progressivism and Faction, to this day, we pay a heavy price for Justice Brennan's anti-theoretical mindset. Even the word price there seems to suggest this is essentially, he's accepting the consequentialist predicates of both Black and Brennan, and he just thinks that the calculus has come out incorrectly. Brennan clearly chose the wrong benchmark for property rights because he supported the grand progressive tradition of letting governments manage communities as they see fit. 
Um, but there are major perils of this worldview, dangers that James Madison grasped in addressing the dangers of faction in Federalist 10. The greatest of these dangers is that the majoritarian politics championed by both Brennan and Wilkinson, he's talking about Harvey Wilkinson here, allowed strong majorities to confiscate the property of an isolated majority and thus transfer the costs that properly belong to all of us onto some. Okay, so, so, does, so does Epstein's economic understanding of this natural rights tradition, classical liberal theory, whoever you want to call it, um, um, first of all, is it, is, we could ask, is it correct that in fact what the American founding is trying to achieve? trying to increase overall gains from trade um, and to avoid um, uh, uh, disproportionate um, bearing of costs. And then secondly, can it do the work that Epstein wants it to do? That is provide a, uh, a principled basis for opposing the judicial revisionism that he accuses Justice Brennan of. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we've gone from Locke to the American founding as interpreted by Richard Epstein. Now I want to look at Frank Johnson Goodnow. This is um, a progressive era essay. Um, and the, in this essay, uh, Goodnow is going to give us uh, yet a different revisionist understanding of American law and the American founding. He begins with the claim that the end of the 18th century was marked by the formulation and general acceptance by thinking men in Europe of a political philosophy, which laid great emphasis on individual private rights. And he's specifically interested in Rousseau and the social con contract. But the basic idea, which is shared by Rousseau and by Hobbes and by Locke and others, is the society itself is regarded as based on a contract made by individuals. So not, he doesn't say this, but not, we might say, in an Aristotelian sense as sort of a natural organic product of human action, right? That political society is not natural to human action, but that it's artificial. It's created by contract, contracts, social contracts amongst individual persons who agree to enter into it and live under it. And then he just gives the back of his hand to Locke's whole theory of how political society and private property come about. Such a theory, of course, had no historical justification. That's the end of that matter. Right? Forget Abraham, forget Lot, forget Cain and Abel, forget you know, any, any historical evidence that you might try to appeal to for the idea that, um, that human beings start off with all things in common and then over time, only over time, come to, um, uh, to divide up the states and societies and uh, develop rules. That, there's just no historical basis for that. It's just, it's just a theory. It's, a, it's made up. Um, but that's not the European view. It's not the European view today, he says. Um, man is regarded now throughout Europe, contrary to the view expressed by Rousseau, as primarily a member of society and secondarily as an individual. And this idea of rights, well, rights of a certain kind, the rights which he possesses are, it is believed today, conferred upon him not by his creator, as the American Declaration of Independence claims, but rather by the society to which he belongs. What they are is to be determined by the legislative authority in view of the needs of that society. Social expediency rather than natural right is thus to determine the sphere of individual freedom of action. In other words, Locke and Blackstone have lost, Bentham and Austin have prevailed. That's the view that now predominates in Europe. And that is that as far as Europe is concerned. Now, the problem is, America is more complicated because not everyone in America is as enlightened as Bentham and Austin. Um, and so we have, to, we have to spend a little more time on the American situation to understand um, some of the nuances. <clears throat> 
American judges, he says, the first thing that happened is American judges modified greatly the conception of individual liberty, which was the basis of English political practice. So the Americans went off course right away. And there were two modifications that he says were most important. In the first place, the rights of men, of which their liberty consisted, were as natural rights regarded in a measure and in no small measure as independent of the law. Now, what does he mean by that? If he means to suggest that the rights of men are not law, that rights and law are different things, which stand on different footings, then that's obviously not the jurisprudential tradition of the American founding. It's obviously not the natural law or common law traditions, right? I mean, Blackstone and Cook and Hale and Story and Kent could not have been any clearer that natural duties and natural rights are part of the law. And in fact, the law properly understood, in, and on this they're in agreement with Aquinas, um, is consists of specifications and derivations of natural rights and duties. Everyone has a natural duty not to kill other people. Therefore, murder is malum in se. And therefore, everyone has a natural right not to be killed. That's just part of the law. That's, it's not independent of the law. That's law. Now, you need further specification. We need to develop uh, sanctions for those who do kill. We need to specify incentives not to kill. Um, we need to have a criminal justice apparatus. We need to specify what are the requirements of due process for those who are accused of killing. All of that is the work of human law, but um, everyone who came before the progressive era would have had no problem saying that the basic principle that murder is inherently wrong and therefore unlawful uh, is part of the law. In fact, it's foundational to the law. So what does he mean by this idea that natural rights are independent of the law? Well, he seems to mean something about uh, the nature of sovereignty. So he seems to accept the premise that law is inherently grounded in sovereignty. And that there are two different sources of sovereignty. One is legislative or lawful or lawmaking sovereignty. And then another is constitutional sovereignty. And he seems to be suggesting that these are two different things. So he says, the separation of natural rights from law, the rendering of them as independent things, uh, is a necessary or logical implication of the American um, penchant for written constitutions, which of course the British do not have. The English don't have it, the Scotch don't have it. Um, at this time, the Australians don't have it, um, as an act of the sovereign people. And it is in this way, he says, that natural rights came to have an existence apart from the law. So you have sovereignty to make law, call it legislative power or sovereignty, and then you have the sovereignty of the people, which is specified in their constitutions, and these two are now in conflict with each other. Um, rather than law being a security for natural rights and therefore civil liberties, which are derived from natural rights, being part of the law, in fact, the justification for law, that's Locke's account, rather than human law being derived from natural rights and duties as specifications of those rights and duties themselves, that's Aquinas' account, arguably it's the account of many of the common law jurists. Um, law is basically grounded in sovereignty. And so the only question is, what do we do about this conflict of sovereigns? Because that's the first great innovation of American jurists, says Goodman. The second place, our American courts emphasize substantive rights rather than the right to particular methods of procedure. Because most of the historic rights of Englishmen had been rights uh, to particular methods of action. 
Thus, the right to a special kind of trial for crime, that is the right to trial by jury, was regarded as one of the most sacred rights of an Englishman. Um, and it follows from this that the rights of Englishmen were therefore, so far as they were defined at all, to be found in acts of legislation and judicial decisions. Well, okay, that is certainly, it is certainly the case that English jurists were nearly obsessed with uh, procedural rights. And it makes sense when you consider that English common law, unlike the continental civilian tradition, was primarily uh, developed as the law of writ, right? Writ practice is what common law essentially was for several centuries. That is that it was the remedying of wrongs. Writs were, de were developed for the purpose of remedying wrongs. And so the question was, how do you administer these writs in a way that's consistent with the requirements of legal justice? That was the basic inquiry. But it was just taken for granted by all the common law jurists that there was a such thing as wrong, which means that there was such a thing as right. And English jurists could not have been any clearer about this. I mean, look at Blackstone, for example. When he begins talking about the absolute rights of Englishmen, procedural rights don't come in for several chapters. He starts on rights such as liberty of movement and the right to life and the natural duties one has toward one's children, which give rise to the natural rights of parents and the natural duties one has in conscience to God, which is the basis of religious liberty. In other words, substantive rights. And you can't get a more quintessentially English jurist than Blackstone. Blackstone believes in parliamentary supremacy, right? So Blackstone is, is, is the, the strongest possible argument you're gonna get for this conclusion, that the rights of Englishmen are defined by legislation. Po strongest possible case you're gonna get for that proposition, you're gonna find in Blackstone's commentaries. And yet Blackstone is very, very clear that those legislative specifications are there to protect substantive rights, the deprivation of which constitutes wrongs. And the whole point of the procedures is to vindicate the rights in the sanctioning and remedying of wrongs. So where is Goodnow getting this idea that um, English rights are merely procedural uh, from which he derives the conclusion that rights in the English tradition are mere products of legislation and judicial decision. Okay, now, even if, even if, Goodnow wants to say, even if the Americans got the English tradition right, which he doesn't accept, but even if they got it right, all of that comes before Darwin. And Darwin changes everything. So skipping ahead, Goodnow says, the political philosophy of the 18th century was formulated before the announcement and acceptance of the theory of evolutionary development. The natural rights doctrine presupposed almost that society was static or stationary rather than dynamic or progressive in character. The rights which man had were believed to come from his creator. These rights consequently were the same then as they once had been and always and would always remain the same. Now, again, I think we can ask fairly, is that a fair, charitable, correct, accurate reading of the tradition? I mean, Aquinas and Blackstone both had an awful lot to say about legal change. Um, now, Aquinas is very clear that legal change in the treatise on law, for example, he's very clear that legal change ought to be done very cautiously and only for very good reasons and only in certain circumstances. But Aquinas doesn't think of society as static. Um, his claim is that the specifications of human law should be changed uh, very cautiously and only in certain circumstances because there are natural law reasons for action which do not change. And so he has two sort of layers to his account of law. There are some aspects, the basic principles of natural law, which do not change. But the particular specifications, Aquinas has no problem conceiving of the, specif the specifications of human laws changing over time. Um, the same is clearly true of Blackstone, who spends pages and pages and pages talking about uh, giving historical accounts for how the various writs and procedures of English common law and the understandings of um, the limits on the Crown's prerogative changed over the various centuries of English history. Um, so it's not entirely clear to me that Goodnow um, is, is uh, 
is not punching a straw man here. But it is certainly the case that all of those jurists, and this, this is certainly a view shared by Locke and Blackstone and Story and the natural law theorists, Augustine, Aquinas, and the rest, Cicero, that there are certain rights. Now, rights, of course, is a bit of an equivocation because it's fair to ask, does right mean the same thing for the moderns like Locke and Hobbes that it meant for the pre-moderns like Justinian and Cicero and Aquinas, which is an interesting question in and of itself. But there are certain, call them norms of law, which are unchanging and unchangeable. So on that, good now is absolutely right. What's changed? Good now says, well, now we're more enlightened. Now we've got Darwin. Um, and we know now that the actual rights, which at the close of the 18th century we were recognized, were, however, as a matter of fact, influenced in large measure by the social and economic conditions of the time when the recognition was made. And so he's he's just he's just accepting in full the late 19th century, early progressive era account of rights and law as being historically contingent. It's all historically contingent. It's all conventional, all the way down. Um, and furthermore, not only is it historically contingent and conventional, but the conventions themselves are determined by forces which are not the product of reason, choice, and action, but rather by the inevitable progress of change in the human condition. Um, okay, the next move he makes is his discussion of the police power. So he says about the middle of the 19th century, the courts of the country invented what is spoken of as the police power, which may be said for all practical purposes, to be unaffected by the private rights theory. The government may exercise this police power unrestricted by the constitutional limitations to be found in bills of rights. So the sovereignty of the legislature has now triumphed over the sovereignty of the people. Now again, is that true? Is that faithful to the early police power decisions themselves. Um, remember, in the 19th century, what it meant to regulate rights was simply to make them more regular. Again, the idea was that there are rights and wrongs which precede their specification in positive law. And insofar as a law is declaratory of those rights, it's simply making clearer, giving us greater clarity about the boundaries of my rights and your rights and where they um, where they meet. It is possible, of course, in the common law way of thinking, for um, rights and duties to be altered. Right? That's, that's the difference between a de purely declaratory enactment and a remedial enactment, which is self-consciously changes the law in some part. Um, but the police power was not understood prior to the progressive era as being carte blanche to make law. It was either a, a greater specification or clarification of law as it existed in a declaratory sense, or a power to change the law in some respect where the law was defective. Um, but be that as it may, it is certainly the case that by the time of the progressive era, the police power has come unmoored from those justifications. On that, Goodnow is absolutely correct. Um, you see this in the early 20th century decisions which begin to reject the doctrine of vested private rights and allow for retrospective applications of new legislation, um, for example. Um, uh, you see this in the rise of health and safety violations, right? laws which prohibit actions which lead to certain bad outcomes, um, regardless of whether the actions themselves are inherently culpable, regardless whether the person who performed the action has any particular mens rea, right? So all the health and safety offenses that begin to proliferate in the beginning part of the 20th century, uh, which are designed to, for example, prevent spoiled milk from being delivered to children in the inner city or, um, you know, prevent people from contracting emphysema from working too long in bakeries or whatever, um, you can be held civilly or even criminally liable for violating those laws, even if you had no intention to do anything wrong, even if you had no intention to violate the law. 
um, but you know, simply a, it's sort of a consequentialist based justification for the use of criminal laws. Um, and so the police power becomes unmoored from its original justification as a security for natural rights and, and, um, and uh, vindication of natural duties. And the result of all this, Good now says, is a lawless people. Um, the, the people keep insisting on their private rights, this old antiquated theory that they have these rights grounded in their own sovereignty, which are independent of the police powers. And it makes them lawless. It sets up a clash between liberty or natural rights on one hand and the law on the other. And this is fundamentally going to be the problem of the 20th century, according to Goodman. This is fundamentally um, the, the central conflict which is going to, to define uh, American political uh, life and American jurisprudence um, in the 20th century. All right, I've already been going for an hour, so I don't want to belabor the Deneen Greg debate. Um, I hope it's provocative enough that you all um, will find something to say about it on your own, because um, I want to shut up now soon and, and talk, uh, let you talk. Um, but uh, before I do that, um, just a couple of questions about Deneen's essay and a couple of questions about Sam Greg's essay. Um, first, with respect to Deneen's essay, what is liberalism? What is it? Um, it looks a little bit, he calls it the liberal experiment. Uh, at times he seems to describe it almost like an ideology. Um, it's non-relational. It seems sort of arbitrary and artificial and unnatural. It looks like, a, it looks like a, an imposition on American political life from some sort of artificial construct or thought experiment or ideological um, bias. Um, it, um, it is radically individualistic. It rejects the ideas of human uh, limitation. It, uh, it sets up this arbitrary sphere of personal autonomy. And then it leads to all this bad stuff. That's basically um, Deneen's account. In a nutshell, he lays all this at the foot of people like Locke. Locke in particular is a, is a villain in Deneen's account. Um, uh, and Locke invented this thing, liberalism, and look what liberalism has done to us. Greg says, um, yeah, we've gone off course. There's, there's, a, there's definitely a problem with the way we do political life. And um, whether you call it liberalism or whether you call it radical personal autonomy, um, whether you call it um, you know, modernism or postmodernism, um, uh, you know, there, there are, we, we, we have to grapple with um, what has become of our ideas about natural law and natural rights and justice and its relationship to law. Voluntarism, for example, is a real problem for Greg's account. Um, one thing he wants to point out, though, is that these tensions go a long way back. Um, a lot of the themes that the Neen attributes to the moderns can be drawn out of ancient writings, all the way back to Plato's Republic. Um, and a lot of the questions, um, particularly the voluntarist ethics, um, that which lead to these sort of arbitrary, uh, from, from Greg's perspective, arbitrary conflicts between sovereigns um, or, or positivism more generally, grounding the authority of law in its source, in a particular sovereign, and then the sovereigns come into conflict with each other. That's the central problem. Um, that stuff goes way back before the modern era. Um, and so this is not an invention of, of uh, Locke and the moderns, Greg claims. And then on the other side, he wants to say that, okay, except that there is such a thing as liberalism or that there are such things as um, civil liberties which can be abused in these ways, um, they can also be rehabilitated if they're reattached to their original grounding in natural law. Which again, go back to chapter five and second treatise of Locke. Uh, of Locke. Um, uh, Locke at least purports at the beginning to be grounding his theory of natural rights 
in natural law and divine law, the law of reason and the law of God. Um, and so uh, Greg, toward the conclusion, says, if by comprehensive theory, Deneen means just another ideology, I can only say, amen, I'm not in favor of ideologies. But at some point, societies that seek grounding in a rational vision of human flourishing require two things. The first is a comprehensive theory of truth and how we know it. The second is people like Aristotle and Aquinas who can explain to us why the theories of individuals like Epicurus and David Hume are seriously wrong. Rightly lived lives and communities are important, but so is rightly ordered thought. Can natural law invest liberal institutions with the coherent philosophical foundations that liberalism cannot? That's a question I hope Deneen and other critics of the liberal order will at some point systematically address. Because whatever the answer, it's a question that really matters. And we might ask of Greg, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Is this a fatalistic concession to the, the world that we just happen to inhabit? We just throw up our hands and say, well, for better or worse, we live in a liberal world. Um, and so we better make the most of it. And we better teach our fellow liberals um, how to reground civil liberty in natural law and in um, standards of critical morality that conduce to human flourishing, rather than which lead to this atomization and this um, unnecessary conflict between sovereigns. Or is Greg saying something more um, provocative? that no, civil liberties and liberal institutions are actually worth preserving because they actually conduce to the good themselves. That liberal institutions like say private property or religious freedom or freedom of conscience um, are actually good for human society and good for the humans who live in those societies. Um, and they not only um, can be invested with natural law content, but they should be um, and should ought to be rehabilitated and preserved. Okay, so there's a bunch of questions um, and some highlights from the reading, which um, hopefully get some juices flowing. For more understanding of law, rights, and each other, see my new book, The Age of Selfies, Reasoning About Rights When the Stakes Are Personal. And visit my website, www.adamjmcleod.com